Come on in, have a seat. You'll need a, you'll need a double space handout for tonight. And uh, we got one chair over here. We got one chair over here. We got, we got, got the gang all back tonight. This is week six and the last six of me. So next week you can come back and do uh, whatever Zach is going to do. I, I really I haven't seen Zach in a while. He's had a long couple weeks. Uh, but uh, but it's, uh, it's going to last a few more weeks, and, and you're, you'll be blessed by, by whatever it is that Zach puts together it's in this area of apologetics. The word apologos uh, comes from that passage in 1 Peter 3 that we've looked at almost every week. Peter says to people who are actually suffering and being killed for their faith. Sound familiar? There's nothing new in, under the sun. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. How do I know if Christ is Lord in your heart? Well, Peter says you're always being ready to make a defense. The Greek word make a defense is apologos. Apologetics comes from that. It doesn't mean we're apologizing for our faith. We're, we're making a defense for our, for our faith. To everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And our goal is to have good answers to these tough questions, and that's been our process over these last weeks, to try to deal with these things that bug us and bug people and try to become equipped with answers that will lovingly uh, challenge people that there is an answer. The scripture is practical and reliable, and we have ways to talk about the tough questions. What about pain and suffering? How do we know God even exists? Is it too narrow to say there's one way to heaven? You know, the people in Iran say there's one way to heaven. <laughs> you can be narrow and wrong, you can be narrow and right, but you can't have both of those options be true. Uh, last week we talked about if, if there is only one way to heaven, is it fair for God uh, to judge people who've never heard. And we talked about that, in it, and all that's up on the website of the church and also on our uh, Facebook page, 7117 Ministries, and our, my personal Facebook page. I think Gwen has posted it too. Hello, dear. How was the meeting? I have a YouTube channel too, yeah. Oh, you got an Israel flight, great. Well, and again, if you want more uh, content, uh, one of the things I enjoy is these are two friends of mine put together an audio series. This is free. You can download them, and they're available in several languages. Uh, it's done in Spanish. It's done in, in Mandarin Chinese. It's done very well in English, and all 12 of these questions are on the searchformeaning.org. Uh, that's what they're up there for. Uh, there are plenty of books, stuff around. Some of you ask about Gwen books. Again, Gwen's books, if you call, we're happy to tell you how to, to get a hold of them. Tonight, we're going to deal with the question, what does it mean uh, to believe, and then specifically, once you believe, can you quit believing? Because we know stories of people who were, let's say they were pastors or youth workers or hung around the church their whole lives, and now all of a sudden they're off on some tangent and don't believe anything anymore. There are people like that in our own family. And so we, we first want to understand, what does it mean to believe? You know, John 3.16 says what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. So what does it mean to believe in Jesus? And if you're really going to get your arms around this, there are uh, three things that you need to know and one thing that you need to do. And that's the handout that you've gotten before you. The first thing is God's position. Say God's position. Say it louder. God's position. Very good. God's position is really twofold. Number one, he loves us. Uh, and then we're going to talk about that in a minute. But then there's our condition. Say our condition. Our condition. And then third is going to be God's provision. God's provision is going to be he sends Jesus as our substitute, and our decision is something we need to do about it other than just know the facts. So we're going to look first of all at God's uh, position. He loves us, John 3, 16, which I already gave to you. God so loved the world, he demonstrated that how. He gave his only begotten son, his one and only perfect son. I have four sons. None of them are perfect. But I wouldn't give any of them for anybody in this room, except maybe Gwen. <laughs> And not always her. <laughs> God had one perfect son, and he said, I'm going to send him for you. Now, I don't have a verse that says this. This is my opinion that I'm going to give you. But I think if you'd been the only person ever to have been born on planet Earth, that God loves you so much that he just sent Jesus to die just for you. I think he loves us that much. And so foundationally, when I'm talking with a friend that doesn't know Jesus yet, you know, and I want to start here. Let's start with God's position. And I'll, I, you need to learn this or some form of it, whether it's the four laws or the bridge illustration or the ABCs in the Baptist church or evangelism explosion. It's a wonderful program. You need to know the points necessary to help somebody to believe in Jesus. And the first point is God's position. I like to start with God's love. Some people don't, but I do. Because 
it's a warm fuzzy. Most people, if they agree that there is a God, they certainly hope that he's loving. Uh, there are probably some instances of God at work in your life where, they, where he's brought you to a place where he's shown you that he's taken care of you up until this point. So I, I'll ask, you know, do you have any problem with that? And most people answer no. But he's also, uh, secondly, perfect. There's the rub. God loves us, but he's perfect. You know, we didn't do this question, but one of the 12 apologetics questions is the works question. How many works do you have to do to get into heaven? You know, and, and I'll ask people, you know, how do you get in? Well, I, I've been a good person. Well, how good have you been? Well, I've tried to keep the golden rule and I haven't murdered anybody. Well, that's a start, you know. And so what I'll do is I'll actually draw a ladder for them. And I'll say, here's, here's a ladder. God's at the top of the ladder and we're down here at the bottom of the ladder. How do we get up the ladder? Every other religious system, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Judaism says you got to work your way up the ladder. And my question then is, okay, how high up the ladder do you have to get before God says, okay, I'll cut the ladder off there and you're in. Let's put Mother Teresa or Billy Graham near the top of the ladder, and I'm going to put myself somewhere in the middle of the ladder, and I'm going to put you know, Putin at the bottom of the ladder. Where do you find yourself? And they always manage to find themselves at least one notch above where they think the cutoff is going to be. <laughs> and the point is God doesn't grade on the curve because God is what? Perfect. In the Sermon on the Mount, you know what Jesus said? You, therefore, ought to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, he's dealing with the Jews, and in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about how righteous do you have to be under the Jewish law. Basically, he says, you've got to obey them perfectly, all 613 of them, and you've got to do it not only outwardly, but inwardly. You have heard it said in the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus, you shall not murder. Okay, I'm good so far, but then Jesus says, yeah, but let me tell you what it really means. I say unto you, if you've spoken angrily with your brother, you've already murdered him. Oh, boy. You have heard it said you shall not commit adultery. Well, okay, I understand in their world, adultery only took place when sex happened. Jesus said, boy, but I say unto you, if you've looked on a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. And therefore, by the end of the first chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 48, he says, therefore, you've got to be what? as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, again, I'll ask my friend, do you have any problem with that? You know, I, my, one guy said, well, you know, if there was a God, you'd want him to be perfect. You know, and he was right. You know, God loves us, but God is perfect. And that leads to our what? Condition. Our condition is, I don't know about you, but I'm not perfect. And that's called sin. Anything about me which is not perfect is sin. Sin is de defined by that. It can be sins of commission, things I do wrong, I cheat on my taxes, I lie to my wife, you know, or things that I should do that I don't do. I should buy my wife flowers, but I don't. Or I should say an encouraging word to someone, or I should do this, do that, the other thing. So all the things about me that are not perfect cause my condition, and my condition is I fall short on that ladder of the glory of God. If God is perfect, and I'm not, there's a separation that exists. And so either I can try to work my way up the ladder by being reincarnated so many times or obeying the golden rule or not murdering someone or just being generally a good person, or I can say, boy, you know, what am I going to do about this? Because God's, our condition is that causes a separation between me and God. Being separated from God is simply what? Death. You know, when someone dies, and we had someone here in the church die today, I lost a friend this week that's been battling cancer for 10 years. Well, his, his name is Ken. And Ken died this week. But you know, Ken's not gone forever. Ken hasn't stopped being. He's just separated from me. I grieve that I won't see him and talk with him and text with him. We worked together for 20 years. I've taken him to Israel two or three times. But Ken was not perfect. I am not perfect. And I'm separated from God because of that. And I remember those days. You know, I grew up in a non-Christian family. We, we hit the church once in a while. We were the Christer Christians, you know, Christmas and Easter. We did a little bit more than that. But I would pray and the prayers would bounce off the ceiling. I, I kind of knew that there was a God out there, but I never connected. And so I knew that God loved me if he existed. And I, and I had an idea that I wasn't perfect. And there was a problem that existed between God. I mean, I learned all this in church. There are many people in churches all over Lakeland and all over America that get these first three things, is God has made a 
a provision for us. And the provision is the substitute. God said, look, you can't get up this ladder. You can't get to the rung high enough to reach perfection. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send somebody down the ladder and he's going to carry you up to me. That's what sets Christianity apart from every other belief system. Every other belief system says, if you're good enough, you can bridge the separation and finally arrive in heaven. Christianity says, you can't do that. So Jesus comes from heaven as the second person of the Godhead, and he takes my punishment for my sin as my substitute. When Jesus died on the cross, he had seven statements that he made. Number six was tetelestai. Do you know what that means? It is finished. It's an accounting term. Literally, it means it is paid in full. It's what the Romans used to stamp on your tax bill when it was paid in full. Because I am sinful, I am separated from God, and I deserve punishment for that. I deserve to spend eternity separated from God. But God says, you know what? I'm going to send Jesus, and he's going to not break any of the laws. He's going to be perfect, and he's going to die on the cross in your place as your substitute. And that debt that you owe God has been paid in full. Once Jesus did that, and by the way, during those last three hours on the cross when the earth was dark, that's the only time in history where the Father and the Son were separated. That's what Jesus was agonizing over in the garden. It wasn't that he was going to die physically. He predicted three or four different times, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to give me over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they're going to kill me. But he was agonizing that possibly, perhaps, in order to forgive the sins of the whole world for all eternity, I might have to be separated from my Father for all eternity. And he's willing to do that for us because he is a perfect substitute. You know, I'm a big baseball guy. Imagine being in the World Series in the bottom of the ninth inning and you're down three runs and you're up to bat. Except over in the dugout is Babe Ruth. Only this Babe Ruth always hits home home run. He never, never swings and misses. He's the perfect substitute. Well, I would be stupid if I said, well, I'll do this. I'll face 98 from the closer, dummy. No, I want Babe Ruth to come up and fulfill my requirement and hit the home run that drives in the winning run and yippee we all celebrate in heaven so that's why jesus comes he is a what substitute there's a whole doctrine you can read volumes about it called substitutionary atonement it's what you learn when you go to the theological cemetery you know we need a substitute we need we either need to pay for this sin problem on our own or we need somebody to come and pay it for us so God's position, he loves us, but he's what? Perfect. Our condition, we're, we're not perfect, so we're what? Separated. Separated from God. God provides what? A substitute who comes down and dies in my place and pays for my sin problem. There's a bunch of illustrations here that I want to, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm going through this with a friend, I like to be able to plug it into an illustration. Back in the 60s, there was a court case in California it was called Goldstein versus the state of California. Obviously, this was a, this was a Jewish judge. <laughs> but Judge Goldstein was a hanging judge. He always gave out the worst punishment that the law allowed. And so one day, one of the reporters for the L.A. Times, back when they had newspapers, found out that the judge's son had a speeding ticket and had to appear in traffic court before Judge Goldstein. And the headline read in the newspaper, Will the hanging judge hang his son? And so the courtroom was packed because of the newspaper article. And at the end of the proceedings, the judge banged the gavel and said, Mr. Goldstein, you are guilty as charged, and your fine will be $150 made payable to the court. And with that, having banged down the gavel, he came out from the bench, and he took off his robe. He put his arm around his son. He said, you're my son, and I love you. And I want you to know that here in my pocket, I have a check made out to the court for $150. You see, that's how God solves the problem of love and justice. Ours is the only faith system that demonstrates God's love for us because he gives us a substitute and satisfies his justice because the substitute pays what we owe in full. You with me? There's another true story about Mayor LaGuardia. Some of you are old enough to remember. Did you know Fiorella LaGuardia? He used to read the comics. He used to read the comics. <laughs> Thanks, George. Well, he was a character, and in the Depression, <laughs> when, when George was just a boy, 
<laughs> in the 20s, he was not only the mayor of New York City, you can fly into LaGuardia Airport now, but he would also serve as a night court magistrate. Okay? And one night, he was there serving as the magistrate, and there was brought before the court a man who was arrested for stealing a loaf of bread. It was the Depression. He brought the man before the bench. He said, how do you plead? He said, Your Honor, I'm guilty. He said, why did you do this? He said, well, I have three children at home. We had no food. I had no money. I stole the bread. LaGuardia said, well, you're guilty. The fine's got to be paid, so here's what the fine is. I'm going to take my... He always wore a fedora. He took off his fedora, passed it around the courtroom, and he fined everybody in the courtroom 25 cents, which in the Great Depression was a lot of money, wasn't it, George? <laughs> and... This poor guy was amazed because at the end of the proceeding, uh, he, his fine had been paid by everyone else in the courtroom. LaGuardia said, I'm fining you for living in a city where a man has to steal a loaf of bread to feed his children. You see, the love and the justice were both intact. God's love for us is demonstrated in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5 eight. You can do most of this with about four verses. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, in my place, as my substitute. So God's love is demonstrated and his justice is satisfied in the person of the substitute. That's what's so great about it. Now listen, I hung around church for a lot of years. I knew about God's position, that he loved me and he was perfect. I knew about my condition, that I was not perfect and separated from God. I knew that Jesus came. But there's something I needed to do about that that I never found out until I left home. And that was step four. I have to do something about this. I have to make a decision. I have to believe. Okay, now, what does it mean to believe? In the English language, we have one word for believe, and it can mean anything from, I believe it would be good to have a glass of lemonade from that jug over there, to I believe I'm going to go home and spend the night with my bride, to I believe in music. Bob's here. I believe in music. I believe in love. That was one of the 60s rock and roll songs, right? I believe, you know, that Israel's in a difficult situation right now. I believe can mean a lot of things on a lot of different levels. So the church fathers in the later years after the church started, when, when Latin was the official language of the church, they had three words for believe that helped me understand the biblical idea behind the concept. So you won't find these words in Scripture. The Latin word in Scripture is a different word than these. But God says, hey, I'm going to give you an opportunity to believe. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son is God's role in all this. That whosoever believes is our role in all this. We get to go to heaven. We have the promise of heaven when God's part and my part come together. And now my part is to believe it. Now what does that mean? Three words in Latin, and these are on your handout. The first word is noticia. It means to notice. It's not a bad word. It's a good word. Let's suppose that you were driving here to the class tonight, and on the way uh, you drove past Linder International Airport, and you saw an airplane getting ready to land, probably an Amazon plane, because it was down low and made a lot of racket. And you walked in here, and I would say, hey, how are you? Good. Anything happened today? Well, I, I noticed that an airplane flew into Linder Airport. Really? Do you believe airplanes fly? If you were speaking Latin, you would say, I noticia that they did. It's a good word, but it's not the biblical idea of believing. But let's suppose that instead of coming to class, that airplane captured your imagination. So you drove to the airport. You found the pilot. You talked to him. You found a mechanic. You talked to him. You got online, you looked up aviation, aerodynamics, theories of flight. You missed the class. I see you the next day. How are you? I'm great. Missed you last night. Well, I was studying about airplanes. Really? Let me ask you a question. Do you believe airplanes fly? If you were speaking Latin, you'd use this word. I assent you that they do. I've intellectually figured out how all this goes together. Make sense? Now, there's nothing wrong with that word, but it's not the idea of biblical faith. The idea of biblical faith comes when you go to the airport and you go to the ticket counter and the flight attendant says, do you believe this airplane can take you to New York or Tel Aviv or San Francisco or wherever you're going? Yep. How do you manifest believing? You get on board. You entrust your life to that 
other circumstance and allow it to do what only it can do. Believing in Jesus is called fiducia faith. We have fiduciary agreements in our legal system. It, it gives us the word fidelity. It's the idea of entrusting my life with something else. When you get on that airplane, <laughs> you know, think about, think about it, 200, even 100 years ago, I'm going to get in a steel tube and it's going to go 550 miles an hour and take me from here to New York in two hours. Whew! It's a big belief to get on that plane. Jesus says, look, you can't get to heaven. You can't get to the top of the ladder. But what I'll do is I'll come and I'll take you. You've got to jump on board. You've got to entrust your life to what Christ has done for you. And that's the only way that you believe in the biblical sense. Early in the 1900s, there was a French tightrope walker. Some of you have heard this illustration, so bear with me. But I, it's, it's one I use with my friends. It makes sense to me. His name was Charles Blondin. Blondin was one of the first men to cross Niagara Falls on a tightrope. He was also a master of sales and promotion. So he sold tickets, and several thousand people showed up to watch Blondin on that morning cross Niagara Falls. I think it's 1,100 feet across. The raging waters below. Have you seen Niagara Falls? It's, it's, it's pretty impressive. It roars. And so he goes out on the wire to start the show, and he does a few tricks, and then he turns around and he comes back to the crowd, and they're, ah, way to go, Charles. <clears throat> he hushes the crowd. He said, okay, how many of you believe that I can cross Niagara Falls with this wheelbarrow and put a 100-pound sack of flour in it? Well, okay. He puts a 100-pound sack of flour in a wheelbarrow. He goes out, crosses the wire, comes back. <sighs> he says, now, how many of you believe I could put a man in this wheelbarrow and push him across the falls in the wheelbarrow? <sighs> he said, okay, who would like to go first? There's actually footage, not of this event, but of him crossing the falls. Nobody came up. Nobody said, I'm going to do this. Nobody said, I'm going to get in that wheelbarrow. Finally, he said something to his business manager, probably said something like, I will double your commission. <laughs> and the guy wouldn't get in the wheelbarrow, but he did climb on the back of Blondin, and together they crossed the falls. Of the thousands of people there, only one person fiduciated. So when I'm dealing with a friend and I'll ask him, where do you stand in this whole thing? You know, what is your level of belief? It's a very unthreatening question because it, it doesn't say, you're going to hell. No, I want them to assume that I'm in this with them. If you had to evaluate where you are in terms of your believing, would you say you've noticed Jesus or you're understanding the intellectual piece or have you really gotten on board? A lot of people, you know, they were at a campfire when they were a kid and sing, sang Kumbaya and they had a warm fuzzy, but they don't really understand that Jesus is the only way to get across the falls. So I'm able to challenge them with that. Let's make sure that we're on board because the promise is that whoever believes in him will not perish but have what? Eternal life. Okay? Any questions on that before we, before we go on? Because that's a big deal for me. That's, that's one of my favorite things to get to do with people. So the way I can illustrate it, and again, this is handy if I'm just sitting at lunch with somebody, I'd say, let's suppose in this glasses case, okay, oh, there's glasses, but let's suppose in there was a list of all the sins Ed Dye has ever committed. We're going to lock that up, <laughs> and now here's Ed Diaz, and here's all his sins, and now here's Jesus. And Jesus is perfect, just like this pack of gum. When I come to believe this is what happens to me, it's called the big switch. Theologians call it double imputation. See, the great thing about Christianity is, look, not only do I get rid of my sin, because who has died for all my sin? My past sin, my present sin, my future sin. When Jesus died on the cross, how much of that was yet to come? All of it. How much did Jesus die for? All of it. And when Jesus died on the cross and I receive him into my life, <clears throat> I get his perfection. So when God sees me, he says, you know what? I'm declaring you're righteous. That's called the doctrine of justification. The whole Protestant church is based on that doctrine. You don't get into heaven because you're justified by yourself. You got all this sin to deal with. But Jesus has taken your sin. <clears throat> You've got his perfection. 
God says, welcome aboard to my heaven because Christ is in you. I am declaring that you are righteous. I hope that makes sense. Now, people go on about their lives, and here's what happens. Understand that there's a difference, a big difference, between having a relationship and being in fellowship. When you do this, and you exchange your sinfulness for Christ's forgiveness and righteousness, you begin a relationship with God that is permanent and irrevocable. It's the same thing that happened with me and my dad. When I was born in 1950, my dad, who's still alive, has been my dad ever since that day. What changes with my dad is my level of fellowship. And with some people, it's, it's not a great big one-time experience. Some people take a while to get there. It was that way with Gwen and I. It's, you know, marriage begins a relationship. But, you know, when I first saw her and she had on this great miniskirt with these cool legs, <laughs> there wasn't anything spiritual going on in my mind. <laughs> but I asked her to sit with me at a table like this. And over the course of the night, I began to talk with her, and I thought she was pretty fun. She was pretty snarky, and I liked that in a woman. And we, we found out on that night we had the same birthday, so I asked her out to dinner. She made me take out my driver's license to prove it. She thought I was just trying to pick her up. I was trying to pick her up, but she wanted proof that we had the same birthday. And I dated her. I, I took her to dinner. She bought, she had uh, eggplant parmesan. I took her out again, I took her out again, I took her out again, and over about six weeks, I wanted to date her exclusively. She was not so involved about this, but that's what I wanted to do. I made a number of decisions. She's, she's attractive, I want to sit by her, I'm going to take her out, I want to ask her out again, I want to date her exclusively. Were we married yet? No. I asked her to marry me in November of that same year. And uh, she gave me the answer every man wants. She said... Do I have to answer you right now? <laughs> Actually, we were in Lakeland down at the old Staples. There used to be a Lakeland drive-in there. Those of you who are longtime Lakeland people remember the drive-in. We were having a fight. She was down here meeting my family, and I drove into the drive-in to quit fighting. That'll shut her up. And, uh, and in the middle of the fight, I looked across the seat, and I said, you know, in my head, I said, as, as much as she's annoying me right now, I really do love this girl. So I, I said, I want you to marry me. And she said... Do I have to answer you right now? Like, can we finish the fight first? <laughs> but we still weren't married. You know, it was a while before I got her a ring. And then we had to make plans to have the wedding. We got married in a little church that is right where the, the tollway is there on Cleveland Heights. It was called Highland Hills Presbyterian Church. And finally, on August 20, 1971, we went to the front of the church and we fiduciated. We exchanged something. We exchanged vows. I gave her my faith, and she gave me her faithfulness, and we've been together for 52 years. So wherever you are in that process, you know, sometimes people take a lot of little decisions to get to the big decision. But the question is, what are you trusting in right now? Have you gotten on the airplane? Have you jumped on the back of Harry Blondin? Have you said, I do to Christ? And once that happens, you have a relationship that's permanent. Now, with Gwen and I, we've been married for 52 plus years. But our fellowship has not always been perfect. I know as easy as I am to be married to, there are still days when I find myself in the doghouse. Does that mean we're not married? When I've been disobedient to my father, do I quit being his son? No. There's a difference between relationship and fellowship. It's very important to understand that because in the Methodist world, the Arminian world, the Pentecostal world, if you sin, you lose your relationship with God and you're back to going to hell. It's a terrible way to live. <clears throat> Going to heaven, not going to heaven. Going to heaven, not going to heaven. Going to heaven, not going. It's a terrible way to live. And that's because they've never understood the difference between relationship and fellowship. When I sin, okay, and the scripture says if I don't sin, I'm calling God a liar, I have an access back to God through confession. I go to God and I say to him the very same thing I say to Gwen. I was wrong. You were right. I'm sorry. <laughs> now I have to mean it because he knows when I mean it. Gwen knows when I mean it too. But that restores our fellowship. So is there ever a time when I come to Christ that I can lose that fellowship and lose that relationship? And let me take you through a couple of more verses, then we'll get out of here. 1 John 5 is written by John. Same guy that wrote John 3.16. He was the youngest of Jesus' apostles. <clears throat> probably Jesus' cousin. Okay. 
Uh, Mary would have been his aunt, and Mary actually lived with John through the end of her life. Jesus gave her to him on the cross and vice versa. But as he nears death, he writes an epistle called 1 John. He writes 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. 1 John 5 says, The testimony is this, that God has given us what? Eternal life. And the life is where? Notice what tense is that verb. The testimony is this. That God has given us what? It's a past tense. This is eternal life, this pen. And this is the sun. Where is the life? The life is in the sun. Look at the next part of the verse. He who has the sun, come on up here, Dan. He that has the sun automatically what? Has the life. He that doesn't have the sun doesn't have the life. Think about that. So the question is, can I fall away and God doesn't want anything to do with me? No, the question is, what have I done with the sun? Have I trusted in Jesus? Have I gotten on the airplane? Have I climbed on the back of Blondin? Have I gone all in with him? He that has the sun has the promise of life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. And then one of my favorite verses, John says, where to go? Well, it says, <laughs> these things I have written to you, 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe, there's that word, in the name of the Son of God, in order that you might hope that you have eternal life? No. What's it say? No. Know that you have eternal life. Isn't that great? That's on the back page. It is on your, on your handout. These things I've written, God wants you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when you show up at the gate of heaven, and God says, why am I going to let you in here? What's the answer to that? It's a pass-fail course. God does not pick a rung on the ladder. He's not grading you on the curve. You're either in or you're not. What's the key to being in? I have Jesus. And you promised that if I had Jesus, I had eternal life. And you know what God will say? Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Oh, there it is. God wants you to know not hope, not guess, not think, not pray about. God wants you to be sure of that. John 1.12, written by John in the, in the Gospel of John, same guy. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So believe and receive are synonymous in the passage. If you've received Jesus, if you believed in him, okay, you have a new identity. You have the right to be what? children of God. See, you are a son or a daughter of the king. It makes life so much easier when you go through life. It doesn't matter where you grew up, what school you went to, what your income is, what car you drive, what church you go to. What matters is who's your father. When you are a child of the king of the universe, you can get through this life. It's not always easy. In fact, he promises it's going to be hard. But there's great benefit in knowing that no matter what I can do, I can't lose that. Paul talks about it in Romans. You know, the church in Rome was being persecuted. They were a disaster. By the way, I went to seminary with a lot of guys. What are you going to do when you get out of school? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pastor a New Testament church. Really? Which one? They're all a disaster. You want to pastor the Corinthians? Yeah, they're getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. One guy's sleeping with his stepmom. They're lying to each other. They're, they're getting drunk at communion. How about that? No, no. I don't. How about the church at Philippi? Well, they don't like each other at all. The elders are lording it over the people in the congregation. So the church at Rome wasn't any different. Paul writes the letters because they're having struggles. But in the end of chapter 8, Paul asks this wonderful question. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. We can go on and on. Financial collapse, COVID, terminal illness, loss of a loved one, marital discord, child that's deserted you. What can separate you from the love of Christ? And then Paul quotes from the Old Testament, and he answers it himself. He says, I am convinced, verse 38. I'm convinced, Paul says, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, and I think he got tired of writing, because then he said, nor any other created thing 
shall be able to do what? Read it with me. Separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you are in Christ Jesus, there's nothing you can do to lose that relationship with the Father. And it comes as a result of knowing God's position. He loves us, but he's perfect. Our condition, we're not perfect, so we're separated from him. God's provision, he sends a substitute to make a payment that you cannot pay for yourself. And my decision to say, I'm in. I'm on board. I don't just notice it. I don't just understand it intellectually. I fiducia. I do. And when you do, God says, you'll be with me forever. Very encouraging verses. And so again, we do this not to just have answers, not to show how much we know, but to say ultimately there's a way that you can know that you're a child of God, that you can know you're going to spend eternity with him. It's the answer to the most important question in the universe. Where are you going to be forever and ever and ever? I'm going to be with Jesus. And that's our job is to help others get there too. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time and this great group, and we thank you for the opportunities you've given us to work through hard questions, and we uh, thank you for your word, which is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. And I pray that you would use us in our community, in our families, and in our world, which so desperately needs to hear about you. We ask, Father, that you would do that in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.